increased Facebook censorship, a red heifer update, and an Israeli plane makes history flying through Saudi Arabian airspace and landing in the United Arab Emirates. The significance of this flight originates 4,000 years ago with a man named Abraham. We will discuss these events and more on this edition of End of the Age. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dave Robbins with End Time Ministries. Thank you for joining me on this edition of End of the Age. Now, we've talked many times about the censorship. I talked about it a little bit yesterday on a replay that we had to play because we were having technical difficulties uh, in our studios. But I talked about censorship yesterday. Well, it never ends. They're censoring End Time and a lot of conservative sites on Facebook, Google, many other sites. Well, according to our notification today, and I know many of you got this as well, Facebook's going to update their terms of service again on October 1. And I promise you, this will affect our site and other sites before this is over with. So what did it say? Well, it said effective October 1, 2020, section 3.2 of our terms of service will be updated to include we can also remove or restrict access to your content, services, or information if we determine that doing so is reasonably necessary to avoid or mitigate adverse legal or regulatory impacts to Facebook. Here we go again. Now, what happened? Well, Newsweek reports that Facebook is struggling to combat far-right extremism, and it threatens to block news from a platform in Australia. Now, this is one of the things that they're going with, is the Australian angle. And they, what happened was, is that they were cornered by news legislation. Um, this is according to Newsweek. And Facebook has threatened to block anyone in Australia from sharing local and international news on its platforms. The move... And the thing is, you got to understand what Facebook has already been doing. This is on top of all the other censorship. But the move which comes in response to a proposed law that would force the Facebook pay, um, community to pay media organizations for their journalistic content that would result in publishers and people in Australia being unable to post news to Facebook and Instagram. Now, I'm saying this because they're saying this all originates in Australia. But we know what they've done to us and many other um, conservative sites. And so this is kind of how it's done is they say, okay, all this thing in Australia, we're going to change our whole, um, we're going to update everything because of what's going on in Australia. But it always comes back over to bite us here in the States and, and everywhere else. I mean, it's going to be Facebook across the board. So as Facebook goes on the legal offensive, critics noted that Facebook was quick to act when facing regulation that could see them have to pay out of pocket, but it has failed to properly block hate speech, far-right conspiracies, and extremist groups. And this is what's been happening all along. On August 19th, Facebook announced that it had removed more than 790 groups, 100 pages, and 1,500 ads tied to QAnon. Most of you are familiar with that. And, you know, they, they say that it's a vast, unfounded political conspiracy theory that has existed online for years, and it's often centered around President Donald Trump. Well, Facebook post the fo this following statement in a blog post. They said, while we will allow people to post content that supports these movements and groups, so long as they do not otherwise violate our content policies, that we will restrict their, their ability to organize on our platform. But this is what you got to watch. Last week, 
a Kenosha Militia Facebook event remained online despite being reported hundreds of times by Facebook users. And during that ev an event in the real world, a 17-year-old was accused of fatally shooting two protesters. And there's more about that in the news if you want to go research it for yourself. However, Facebook removed the malicious group page and the event listing the day of the shooting with Zuckerberg calling the oversight um, an operational mistake during the staff Q&A. The platform has recently faced a widespread ad boycott over its hate speech policies uh, with civil rights groups alleging that it is falling, failing to stop the spread of malicious content. So the Australia proposals yet to be approved by the government could make Facebook and Google pay media organizations in uh, royalties and the, hence the supposed change to their terms of service. But it's not just going to be geared towards Australia, this news group. No, it's going to be across the board. So there you are, more censorship coming October 1 on Facebook. And I know it comes, we, we felt it here in, um, at End Time Ministries. And we've lost millions of viewers from our social networking sites because of censorship. And we've come up with a solution to that. And it's into the age plus. That's one of the things you have to go on. We've got a lot of people that have subscribed to Into the Age Plus. It keeps us from being censored. An open pipeline. Major internet companies are silencing and censoring Christian voices online. These companies are trying to control what you see and hear. Almost 200 videos of ours have been marked as restricted online right now. That's why we launched End of the Age Plus, a platform where the truth won't be censored a platform where we can preach the message of the gospel when you subscribe to end of the age plus today for just $12.99 a month you can watch all of our content in a secure easy to view way from your favorite device when you go to watch.endtime.com and subscribe you'll get instant access to all of our teaching resources including revelation the unveiling of jesus christ understanding the end time end time magazine and so much more we will not censor our message to comply with what the world deems as politically correct. Go to watch.endtime.com right now or search End of the Age Plus in the App Store or Google Play. We've seen Bible prophecy fulfilled like never before. From the halls of the United Nations to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, End Time Ministries continues to reveal the Bible prophecy in the news headlines around the world every day. Whether it's through our broadcast or online at our Jerusalem Prophecy College, your gifts enable us to put vital materials in the hands of those who need it most. Because of you, we continue to replace fear with faith. In the hearts of Christians around the world, we will continue to see prophecy come to pass at an even swifter pace. We need your support. Your donation of any amount enables us to continue to broadcast and be a voice in the ever-growing censored media. To become a partner or give a one-time gift, visit endtime.com or call 1-800-END-TIME right now. That's 800-363-8463. Go online now. Visit endtime.com. So because we're being uh, censored so much, we had to come up with Into the Age Plus. Into the Age Plus is a site that gives you access to everything that we have. And it also allows you to watch um, a lot of the content that has been censored by Facebook, Google, a lot of different places. And uh, it gives you more content than that. I mean, the Bible studies that I'm doing on Friday morning on Zoom, which are around the world, anybody can join that. Those are posted up there. I think it's like a, a few days after we get through with the Bible study. You can go watch it live or go watch it archived. And so there's a lot of information up there that is totally uncensored. Vimeo is just simply a pipeline that allows us to, uh, to pump out information. And in the end time, information is going to be very key. There's a, there's a huge propaganda machine in the United States, if you haven't noticed that by now. That's pushing their agenda. 
and 90% around about 90% of the news media in America is controlled by just five or six companies. That leaves just a real small segment for conservative people that are telling the truth, not agenda driven for you to get your information from. And they're trying to censor them. Facebook's one of the ways. And so um, you really need to consider going on at the end of the age. It's simple. Go to endtime.com. It's right there. Subscribe to end of the age. It's like 15 bucks a month. And you can use it to teach other people, learn yourself, get information that you're not going to get anywhere else. So very important. End of the age plus. Go to endtime.com and subscribe today. Now, I wanted to give you a red heifer update. Uh, what's going on with the red heifer? Well, can you explain the prophecy of the red heifer? A lot of people, they hear it, red heifer and the prophecy, and they get all excited, and they think, oh, red heifer, and there Israel's raising, raising red heifers. The Lord's going to come back tomorrow. No. you got to understand the prophecy of the red heifer. What's it all about? What's the significance? So I'm going to give you just a, a brief explanation of that, give you an update, and then we'll go into the um, Jared Kushner's flight over to the United Arab Emirates. So the red heifer, um, Numbers 19. In the Bible, in Numbers 19, it teaches the Jewish people that any people, um, any person that has contact with a dead body, he or she is ritually impure. Anybody who's been through a, um, a, a graveyard, uh, been in a hospital where somebody passed away, I mean, pretty much everybody in Israel has been in some way or another contact with a dead body. So... According to scripture, they're ritually impure and they can't go into the sanctuary or a third temple of the Lord until they've been purified. The commandment back in Numbers 19 describes the only means of the people under the law being purified from contact with a dead body. A red heifer without blemish and, with, uh, and on which a, um, a yoke has never been placed has to be killed. It's body burned and the ashes are mingled with water. And um, the one to be purified has to be sprinkled by the mixture in order to be cleansed from the curse of death. Only after the prescribed treatment can a person then go to the sanctuary of the Lord or the third temple they're wanting to build. So the Jewish people today, they assume that pretty much all of them have had contact with death, and therefore the entire nation is impure. I mean, think about going down into the Kidron Valley. All of the tombs on both sides of that between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives. So if, you, if any of them went down in that, in that valley, then they have in some form or fashion come in contact with death. So pretty much all of Israel is going to have to be purified by this purification sacrifice of the red heifer to be able to go to the third temple, which will be built very soon. Consequently, it has become the highest priority of religious observant Jews to find a qualified red heifer to cleanse the people from this death curse. So until that's accomplished, they don't believe that they can build their longed for third temple. Well, you know the situation with the peace agreement and all these things that are coming together real quick. So these guys are driven to get a red heifer so they can do the purification sacrifice so then they can build the third temple and reinstitute the um, sacrifices for the atonement for sin. The Temple Institute in Jerusalem, we go there twice a year. We know all them guys, great people. They have been the leading drive towards building Israel's third temple. The, the Temple Institute, they've created all the furniture and the utensils necessary for the resumption of of the temple worship, the, the, even the a, um, altar, a, uh, Ark of the Covenant. The only two things that are stopping the construction of the temple on the Temple Mount are the dispute between the Muslims and Jews about the control over the Temple Mount itself and the absence of this required red heifer. The Jews believe when they acquire the red heifer, God will resolve the political dispute. And according to Jewish tradition, there have been uh, what, nine red heifers offered for the purification from death since the commandment that was originally given back to Moses. 
Just nine. Remember, this is not the daily sacrifice. This is just the purification sacrifice. Two different things. So it is believed that the last red heifer was offered during the era of the second temple, but which of course ended with the destruction of the, the temple in 70 AD by the Romans. And since Israel took possession of the Temple Mount during the uh, 1967 Six Days War, Jews have been wanting to build their third temple. Uh, and it, they began to search for this, a qualified red heifer. I mean, globally. Well, in, um, so back in 2015, Israel National News uh, reported that on, what was it, July 15th of 2015, that the Temple Institute began partnering with an expert Israeli rancher to raise a herd of red heifers for future use in the third temple. This is going on as we speak. Many of you already know, we've talked about it many times. They quoted the Temple Institute as saying that, make no mistake, the project is no less than the first stage of the reintroduction of biblical purity into, it, into the world a prerequisite for the building of the third temple. So there, they, there are many red heifers. There's not just one, there's many of them. Some have just been born this year. Some were born a couple years ago. And a, as a result of this project, five red Angus cows were carrying calves that, will be, that were um, born in 2018. The Institute, of course, was hopeful that one of those calves would, be a, would become a qualified red heifer. If so, the sacrifice could be made, the mixture would be available for the purification of the people of Israel. Well, they then, uh, that, the, that red heifer would then be qualified to launch the building of Israel's third temple, the first Jewish temple, of course, in, in uh, what? About 2,000 years. So back in 2018, the first calf that was born to that project was a male calf. And of course, that disqualifies it from being a heifer. Um, the second calf was a female, but she possessed um, blemishes. And that, of course, that disqualified her. It's got to be a totally red heifer. On August 28th of 2018, which would have been, what, 20, two, two years and three days ago, one of the cows gave birth to a female calf. One week after its birth, this newborn red heifer was certified by a board of rabbis and she fulfilled, of course, at that time, she fulfilled all the biblical requirements. And the rabbis emphasized that the red heifer could at any time acquire a blemish, rendering it unsuitable. And believe me, they've been checking it and checking it and checking it since then. Uh, they've been, you know, like uh, they, they go, they'll go in and do periodical inspections and the latest inspection was performed last month in August of 2020. So what happened? Well, the Temple Institute, I'm going to give you an update from them. And this is their August 2020 update. Because a lot of people have been saying, hey, did they sacrifice the red heifer? What happened on August 29th? What, what's going on? Well, the red heifer, well, let me read you what the, I'm going to quote from Rabbi Azaria Ariel because he gave the uh, update in last month. I want to read you specifically what he said because it explains everything because there's a patch on this red heifer that is not quite up to snuff. So Rabbi Azaria Ariel said, he is, say, who's he? Well, he's the leading Temple Institutes. Uh, he's leading their efforts to raise this red heifer for the performance of the commandment of producing this purifying ashes of this red heifer. He recent, last month, he inspected the current red heifer candidates. One of these two mature candidates is still very viable despite, and here it is, this is the key. She currently has a few hairs which are not sufficiently red as is required by Jewish law. So right now, they're still inspecting because they can't do anything with her because some of the hairs are not totally red. Two new candidates were born in the early months of 2020 and they are currently viable. So they've got a, they've got a herd of red heifers here. But they've got some that they've separated and they're really, really watching. 
So this uh, Rabbi Azaria, he said that we are hoping with God's help to raise a kosher red heifer with the intention of fulfilling the commandment and creating the ashes for a red heifer, thus enabling all of Israel to be purified from the impurity of um, the, the tame met, uh, thereby be able to perform many commandments that are required by spiritual purity, such as the tremat or and tithes and many commandments whose proper performance are reliant on the purifying power of the ashes of the red heifer. He said, in the meantime, we're standing next, he was in a video standing next to a red heifer candidate whose status is somewhat uncertain. He said that she bears a patch of hair that is not currently sufficient red, but that there is a very real possibility that these red hair, that these hairs could redden, become more red before very long. And then they will return out there, check her again. And believe me, they've been doing inspections all the time. So they're going to, they're going to hopefully this patch on her will become more red. They're going to return out there, check her again with the hope that she would at that time be kosher for the performance of the commandment of the red heifer. So to answer a lot of your question on August 29th, no um, sacrifice. The one, the candidate that they're really looking at has, they discovered a patch that's not totally as red as they think it should be. So he said, hey, we're going to have to just wait and see what happens to this. Hopefully this will redden up to the point where she could go um, along with what the law says, the Jewish tradition and the law, and we could go ahead and sacrifice her. So that's kind of a red heifer update. I wanted to give you a kind of an overall view, what the prophecy said, why they need this. And I could go a lot deeper, but I don't want to take time to do that today because I got a whole um, section on Jerry Kushner and what's going on with the Middle East. But they could they, they, they can't perform a sacrifice right now because the one that's ready has a patch on her that's not totally red. So if you got any more questions about that, you can email me or Doug. But that's, a, that's what we know as of right now. I know the people at the um, Temple Institute, and this is their latest update, August of 2020, just last month. They went out there and checked her, okay? Now, let me uh, shift gears here to Jared Kushner. What, ha what happened just, um, just the other day that would have, this would have been Monday morning, and again, I wanted to come on the radio with this yesterday, but we had a glitch. Our clock wasn't uh, connecting, uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't jiving with the radio stations and I couldn't do a program. So we had to do a replay. So I was like, you got to be kidding me. Well, history was made and I can't get on the air today. So um, that's what we're going to cover today. And I'm going to show you how this is very prophetic. And it also ties into Abraham, which set all this thing in motion, God and Abraham, for thousand years ago. So what happened? Well, Jared Kushner's, this historic plane ride to the United Arab Emirates, very prophetic. The Times of Israel reported that the, this El Al flight landed in the United Arab Emirates after becoming the first Israeli plane that was not a cargo plane to um, cross Saudi Arabia. So what happened? Uh, the um, Abi, Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates, in a historic milestone, an Israeli passenger plane flew through Saudi, Saudi Arabian airspace Monday on the first direct non-cargo flight between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. It was the first time an Israeli plane was given permission by the Saudi Arabian kingdom to use its airspace. This is very, very critical to what President Trump's trying to do in the region to get a regional agreement with many other nations. So Saudi Arabia in the news would say, no, we're standing behind the Palestinians. We're not on board with this. But there are a lot of things. There are a lot of backdoor uh, discussions happening to where, think about it. The United Arab Emirates have now signed, or they're going to sign an agreement very soon, normalizing relationships with Israel. Jared Kushner is saying, hey, I think that it's very likely that many more will come on in just the next few months. So the plane that flew to the United Arab Emirates, it brought senior officials from Washington and Jerusalem to the um, Emirati capital to lay the groundwork for the so-called Abraham 
accord. Now, I will tell you, if you've never been to Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates, something like that, fabulously wealthy. I have a friend, very close friend of mine, that went to Abu Dhabi. I'm just throwing this in here, point of interest. You, you may find this fascinating because I did. United, uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, they went there, they visited it. They, stay, they, they went and visited, they, I don't think they stayed in it, but they went and visited a six or seven ho star hotel. You've heard of a four star hotel or a, maybe even a five star, but have you ever heard of a six or seven star? A cup of tea cost them $200, a cup of tea in a seven star hotel. So you can imagine the wealth that is in the United Arab Emirates. Just to give you an idea, well, these, this is the first country to normalize relationship with Israel. So they're going to they're gonna be doing trade. They're going to be sharing technology. I mean, there's a lot of things that can benefit Israel and on the tech side, benefit Abu Dhabi and the um, United Arab Emirates. So it's not like a third world country. I'm talking about a six or seven star hotel with $200 cups of tea. I mean, come on. So very important for move for Israel and for the United Arab Emirates. So the Times of Israel reported that Jared Kushner was asked in an interview with the United Arab Emirates, uh, the WAM news agency, whether he believed all 22 Arab states could eventually recognize Israel. And Jared Kushner replied, absolutely, 100%. Israel Hayam reported that the significance cha this, that the um, changes brought about by this new Arab United Arab Emirates Israeli peace deal in the Palestinian, they give several points of why this the significant changes of this. Guess what? Most of them were geared towards the Palestinians. That's where the prophet prophetic part comes in. So when we get back from the break, I'll go into some of these very very significant changes in the Middle East concerning the Palestinians, that's prophetic. Move Mountains with Irvin Baxter. This book by Irvin's grandson provides 30 days of devotion that will enhance your relationship with God and others. Authentic illustrations from early morning devotions at end time will help you find your purpose and eliminate fears. Commit to taking this 30-day journey and experience real life change. Get your book for only $14.99. Call 1-800-363-8463 or go to endtime.com slash move. I have left a piece of my heart in Israel and her people. We would like to thank End Time for doing such an awesome job with our Israel tour. We marvel at your team keeping the time schedule, keeping everyone comfortable, the wonderful driver, the brilliant guide, the entire tour program, good hotel choices, and stellar food. We had the privilege to rub shoulders with Pastor Baxter, listen to his current teachings, and had some interesting questions answered so eloquently. He is wonderful. Helene from Australia. Experience the Holy Land in the most amazing way. Join Irvin and Judy Baxter for our upcoming Israel tour. For more information, go to endtime.com or call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. If your station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com and click the watch button to continue today's broadcast. You can also finish up later by clicking the archive button. So the Israel Hayam, it's kind of like Israel's USA Today, if you think about that here in the United States. They reported the significant changes brought about by this new United Arab Emirates uh, Israeli peace deal in the Palestinian context, because that's what I'm looking at. I, I mean, I, I think it's awesome that the United Arab Emirates would, would uh, have a peace deal and normalize relations with Israel. But what does this have to do with the prophecies of the Bible? Well, you know about the peace agreement we're talking about uh, that will start the final seven years. That's got to be between Israel and the Palestinians, not between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. So I want to know, what's this got to do with the Palestinians? That's what I'm uh, looking for here. Well, 
there are four specific things that is of significance with the Palestinians from this United Arab Emirates Israeli peace deal. Number one, it critically damaged the Palestinians' ability to exert pressure on Israel within the terms of a peace agreement to return back to pre-67 lines, which are totally indefensible, with minor modifications and to demand the establishment of a Palestinian state that will not recognize Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. So there are some serious ramifications from this because they're kind of taking away the old Arab peace initiative that gave the Palestinians a veto. We've talked about it many times. The agreement with the Emiratis enables two options either to continue the status quo or implement President Trump's peace initiative, including the application of Israel's sovereignty in parts of the Judea and Samaria that's not off the table. And at this point, the status quo may continue for a while, yeah, a long time, maybe, especially if the Democrats win the elections. Because these people understand that the Democrats are for a two-state solution as aligns with the international community, okay? However, the possibility of applying sovereignty remains a future alternative and its status may be strengthened if the Emiratis change their position regarding the agreement. So, number three, the Palestinians have actually lost one of their main levers of influence, the ability to prevent normalization between Israel and the Arab states, which would be their veto power, in recent years, the Palestinians' lever had already been weakened, but with the new development, it has nearly evaporated, which is huge because every nation that normalizes relations with Israel, more of that veto power goes away. And they'll, they'll almost force the Palestinians to come to a negotiating table and to normalize relationships with Israelis as well. The other Palestinian lever is, of course, the ability to impose this veto that we've been talking about and prevent changes on the ground without Palestinian consent eroded as well, but it still exists. And there are many Palestinians that would like to go ahead and normalize relationships with Israel. And you understand that Mahmoud Abbas is in his mid-80s. So it is possible that in the near future, he could be swept from power and people that are pro Palestinian pro-Israelis, think about that. There is such a thing that they would come into power and then a peace deal would almost be automatic. There are articles out there if you search for them. So as a result, the Palestinians now face Israel from a position of greater weakness. They still have several tools left, such as the support of growing groups in the United States Democratic Party that support the Palestinians, blind European support, and the support of the radical camp Iran and its satellites of Turkey and Qatar. And the Palestinians also have the ability to use force and to leverage their presence on the ground, with, uh, which forces Israel... Uh, which does not want to rule over them. There, are, there is a faction. And then, of course, the international community to deal with their cause. The international community is against Israel and their right to East Jerusalem and the West Bank. They say that's illegal in the eyes of the international community with Resolution 2334, which the Obama administration allowed to pass. They could have vetoed it, but they allowed it to pass just before President Obama left office at the end in what? In December of 2016. So there's a lot of, of prophetic significance to this United Arab Emirates Israeli deal because of how it influences the Palestinians' ability to resist a peace agreement. See? Now, Israel Hayam, they also reported a, an article that I read, and this is very interesting. Will Abbas be forced to do an about face on the Temple Mount? Well, of course, prophetically speaking, we're all interested in that, right? A future temple being built, perhaps? They reported that the Palestinians are having a tough time swallowing not only the, the process of normalization between 
uh, Israel and the United Arab Emirates, but, and possibly soon Bahrain and Sudan and a lot of other nations, but also its religious aspect. Jared Kushner expressed a vision of crowds of Muslims from Gulf states praying at the Al-Aqsa Mosque with a message of tourism, openness, and tolerance. Well, that's kind of put Mahmoud Abbas between a rock and a hard place. Why? Well, until now, openly, he's encouraged Muslims from around the world, hey, come visit Jerusalem. But he's ambivalent about Kushner's message. Why? Well, on one hand, Abbas rejects the normalization deal, but on the other, he supports the idea of Muslims coming and occupying Jerusalem and the Islamic holy sites. And he wants them to defend the occupied Al-Aqsa or the, the, uh, what the, the Temple Mount, which the, he says the Jews defile by their presence and they threaten to destroy. So Abbas is yet to decide how to categorize this, the new Muslim crusaders. He wants them to come, but he doesn't want the normalization. So now he's kind of getting driven into a, a wedge here between a rock and a hard place. What's he going to do? Is there, is there a time when he could be pressured to the point where he would have to change his views on the Temple Mount and how that's run? And if they have to go along with the President Trump's peace accord, there may be a time because it says that everybody should be allowed to pray there according to their traditions. Well, I just went through the red heifer prophecy. If they were to get a red heifer, slaughter that, do the purification sacrifice, they would want to pray up there according to their tradition, which is what? The temple. So you can see all this stuff coming together. And I can't wait to see how it all plays out, to be honest with you. I know there's going to be a temple built. I know there's going to be a peace agreement done. You can kind of see things coming together now. So, I mean, wow, I wish I was the Lord and I could, I could say, okay, this piece, this piece, step number one, two, three, four, can't do that at this point. But look at what's going on in the Middle East the flight over the Saudi Arabian airspace, landing in Israel in uh, United Arab Emirates, Jared Kushner and them, and Israeli delegates, and um, normalization with the United Arab Emirates and Israel. This is all unprecedented. You've got the peace agreements with um, Egypt and Jordan, but look at what's going to happen now with the United Arab Emirates. Even with Egypt and Jordan signing agreements with Israel, the Palestinians still had that veto power. <clears throat> but that is quickly going away the more nations that sign normalization uh, with Israel. So, very important what's going on, very prophetic. Another thing I wanted to talk about is the, Air, the Abraham Accord. Isn't it crazy how they've named it the American Accord? And we've been talking about the Abrahamic Covenant for, Irvin Bash has been talking about it for decades now. So, what happened? Well, at a press briefing from the Oval Office at the White House and that was announcing the signing of this historic Abraham Accord peace agreement, the United States Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, explained why the peace agreement is called the Abraham Accord. He said, Abraham, as many of you know, was the father of the three great faiths. He's referred to as Abraham in the Christian faith, Ibrahim in the Muslim faith, and Abraham in the Jewish faith. And no person better symbolizes the potential for unity among all these three great faiths than Abraham. And that's why this accord has been given the name, the Abraham Accord. Well, of course, when we heard the name Abraham Accord, we were like, ding, ding, ding. Oh my goodness, we've been calling it the Abrahamic covenant forever. Daniel 9, 27, and he, the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for a seven-year period. It's the Abrahamic covenant going all the way back to Genesis 15, 18. So I wanted to kind of give you a little insight into how all of this 4,000 years ago between Abraham and God, how it brought us to today and how significant this is. When you talk about Christians, Jews, and Arabs together, the significance of yesterday morning's historic airplane ride to the United Arab Emirates, it originated 4,000 years ago. And it's by grand design by Almighty God. So, Jerusalem Post, they said that is the United Arab Emirates deal a manifestation 
of Abraham's legacy. And they said that, they reported that really remarkably, Abraham's legacy is so powerful and relevant that a peace accord is named after him almost 4,000 years since his birth. Uh, Dor Gold, who is the Jewish Council of the Emirati's president, Ross uh, Creel, he said that this reminds me of a, a midrash that describes how at the moment of Abraham's passing, his warring sons, Isaac and Ishmael, reconciled at his funeral holding hands. Where do you get that? Genesis 25, 7 through 9. It says, this is the sum of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last uh, breath and died in a good old age. An old man full of years was gathered to his people and his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite. And then the Jerusalem Post picked it up again and they said, and now, all these generations later, the children of Abraham, the descendants of Isaac and Ishmael, Isaac being uh, Israel, Israelites and Ishmael, the Arab nations, have begun a historic reconciliation through the United Arab Emirates Israel deal, so aptly named the Abraham Accord. Now, the, this is the reporting from the Jerusalem Post. I haven't got to my segment yet. I'm getting there. And it said that they are setting out a path to peace in this conflict of brothers. Remarkably, Abraham's legacy is so powerful and relevant that a peace accord is named after him 4,000 years since his birth. And we are witnessing the fulfillment of the divine promise of Abraham that you will be a father of a multitude of nations. We're actually witnessing a whole lot more than that. God chose Abraham to champion the moral and spiritual values vital to the humankind to survive and to thrive. So, 4,000 years ago, everybody, Abraham, or, uh, Almighty God gave Abraham two promises. The promise of the promised land, Israel, which they only inhabit a really small portion of that today, you understand, and the, gave Abraham the promise of the promised land and the promised seed. And we said, no, he, they promised him millions. I mean, as the sands of the sea. No, no. Galatians 3.16. Well, I'm, I'm going to hold. I want to make sure you guys get this. I'll talk to you about it on the back, on the back end of the break. But the, God promised him a specific promised seed. That's what I'm talking about right now. Who was to be this promised seed? Do you know? See if you can answer it during the break. Who's the promised seed, singular, that God promised Abraham? Who was the fulfillment of that prophecy? Most of us walk around day by day blind to the prophecies being fulfilled right before us. Every news report brings a new piece to the puzzle in the race towards the final seven years and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, more than ever, it is important for God's people to understand the times in which we are living. On November the 12th, 2013, we opened our Jerusalem Prophecy College in downtown Jerusalem. These same courses are now available online for people who are unable to attend the classes in person. We welcome students to join us and discover the link between current events and the prophecies of the Bible. Take your place in the prophecy of Daniel 11.33. Enroll in the Jerusalem Prophecy College today. Go to JerusalemProphecyCollege.com. So who was the fulfillment of the prophecy and the promise that God gave Abraham 4,000 years ago, the promised seed singular? Well, the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 3.16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to our seed, singular, who is Christ. So Jesus Christ is the promised seed unto Abraham by God 4,000 years ago. He is also the father of the Arab nations through Ishmael. 
But the promise was with Abraham through the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose name was later changed to Israel. Remember the all-night wrestling match. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So the Abraham Accord, let's talk about that. What's the significance of what's going on right now? Because you can kind of get confused when they call it the Abraham Accord, and then they start talking about the United Arab Emirates uh, signing an agreement with Israel. You might think, well, hey, maybe this, I mean, if you didn't really know the prophecies of the Bible or the stories of the Bible, what it all, what all happened back then and what's happened over the last 4,000 years, then you might think, well, hey, you know, maybe the Arabs are um, in this promise and that they should sign agreements and all this other stuff. And this is the Abrahamic Accord. Well, the one we're looking for is the Abrahamic covenant, which is God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and that lineage, the promised land. The peace agreement that starts the final seven years will set the boundaries and it will recognize, the international community will recognize Israel's right to exist in the promised land. The Abrahamic Accord is not pertaining to the United Arab Emirates or any other Arab nation. And the Abrahamic covenant, I should say. The Abrahamic Accord does. So there's a difference. And that's why I wanted to explain to you really what's going on here pertaining to the promised land. So let's talk about the Abrahamic Accord and the Abrahamic Covenant, okay? Two different things. So, the beginning. God covered the first 2,000 years of human existence, uh, human history in just 11 chapters in the Bible, Genesis 1 through 11. He then slams on the brakes and devotes the next 12 chapters to the life of one man, Abraham. So now that you understand the importance of Abraham, God had given a promise to Abraham. You shall have a son through this son shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. 25 years after the promise had been given, Abraham and his wife Sarah were still, they still hadn't had a child. By that time, Abraham was 85 years old. Sarah was 75. Their faith in God's promise kind of began to waver a little bit. I mean, let's just be honest. Sarah suggested to Abraham, hey, perhaps you need to, you know, we need to be a little proactive here. I mean, you guys know the story. So uh, she may have said to Abraham, uh, now the Bible doesn't say this, but I'm, this is me. Hey, Abraham, you know, after all, God helps those who help himself. So Sarah, you know, she had this handmaid, Hagar, and she suggested to Abraham, hey, why don't you take, Abraham, uh, take Hagar as a second wife so that, Sarah could obtain children by her. Well, Hagar did conceive, he did that, and he conceived a son by Abraham. He called his name Ishmael, Abraham's firstborn son, very important. However, Hagar flaunted the fact that she could bear a child to Abraham and that Sarah could not. Imagine being in that household, ladies. So this brought tremendous conflict to Abraham's family. I mean, you can only imagine. Well, when Ishmael was 14 years old, Sarah finally gave birth to a son, Isaac, the promised son. By this time, Sarah was 90 years old. Abraham was 100. So a, a very incredible miracle, right? Well, there was no doubt that this was the promised child. So this is where it kind of comes in where, uh, and the reason I wanted to talk about this is because the Abraham Accord, there are some Arabs that say, hey, we have a right to the holy, the, the uh, promised land because Abraham was our father as well. Ishmael was the first, firstborn son of Abraham. So we have a right to that. There has been that argument. However, I'm going to read to you that God made the promise to Abraham and Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through that lineage. lineage. It's found in Genesis 17, Verses 1 through 22. Very important when we're talking about the Abraham Accord here. Because you may have a conversation with somebody that says, hey, the, Ar the Arabs do have a right to the promised land. You can say, oh no, not according to Genesis 17. Genesis 17 verse 1 uh, says, and when Abraham was 90 years old, remember the story I just went through. When Abraham was 90 years old, and when 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, 
I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between thee, between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him. And he said, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, Abraham, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Well, we've watched that happen. There's nations all over the Middle East that Abraham's the father of. Neither shall thy name any more be Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful and make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Now you can, if you stopped right there, then you would say, well, hey, Ishmael and Isaac were the sons of God, or of Abraham, right? But you can't stop reading. It goes on to say, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. If you stopped right there, hey, the Arabs have a right to the land of Israel, right? You can't stop reading. You've got to keep on going. The Bible says, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. And then God tells Abraham about the covenant and the, the, uh, about circumcision and everything that's supposed to happen there. And God said unto Abraham, As for, thy, uh, thy, as for Sarai, uh, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai anymore, but Sarah shall her name be. So in Genesis 17, that's where their name becomes Abraham and Sarah. And God said, and I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell on his face and he laughed. Don't ever laugh at God. But Abraham did. And he said in his heart, shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is 99 years old, bear a child. And, a, and Abraham said unto God, Oh, that, now here's where we get it. This is where God makes a distinction. And this is very important when you're having conversations, teaching Bible studies, you got to know about the geopolitical situation in 2020 and what happened 4,000 years ago. Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Ishmael's my firstborn son. Oh, that he... Now, God's telling him about this everlasting covenant. And God told Abraham, hey, your wife Sarah's going to conceive and bear a child. Abraham laughs. Yeah, she's 99 years old. Come on, God. Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God says, listen to me, Abraham, I'm talking to you. Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And Isaac. Here it is, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him. I'll make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac. Not Ishmael, but with Isaac, and which Sarah shall bear, bear unto thee at this time next year. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. So here it is, folks, 4,000 years ago, Genesis chapter 17. You can read it for yourself. Abraham, God said, Abraham, I'm going to make an everlasting covenant with you and with your seed. And Sarah's going to bear you a child. Abraham said, yeah, right, God. That, come on, you're just joking. Well, God wasn't joking. He said, listen to me, Abraham. Sarah is in fact going to bear you a child this time next year through the time of life and the pregnancy, she's going to have a baby. And that's the lineage that we're going to go with. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, through that lineage. And Abraham again said, well, God, come on, what about Ishmael? And the Lord said, I've, I've seen Ishmael. I'm going to bless him. 
but the covenant, the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant that I'm going to make with you is going to be through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and that lineage, which is the modern day nation of Israel. I understand that in the news, they're calling this United Arab Emirates, um, Israel deal, the Abraham Accord, which it could lead, when they get all these nations on board, it could lead to the Abrahamic Accord between the Palestinians and Israelis. But I've had people ask us many times, how do you guys know for sure it's going to be between the Israelis and the Palestinians? Because the Palestinians are the only ones vying for the land. Think about it. They're, the international community in 1947, when the United States gave the partition plan in the land of Palestine, which is what it was called for almost 2,000 years. It's called the land of Palestine. The Romans named it that almost 2,000 years ago. The land of Palestine, the Arabs, and there was a faction of Israelis, Jews that lived there all the way through. They, they were going to give them a partition plan. They recognized that the Jews should have a homeland there. So they gave them, they partitioned it out and they gave the Jews a, a portion and they offered the Arabs a portion. The Arabs rejected it. The Jews said, absolutely, they, they accepted it. And when the um, British mandate, when they said, hey, we're moving out, the, uh, the um, Israel, the Jews, they declared independence on May 14th, 1948. The Arabs there, they, they considered themselves the Palestinians. That's what they are. They, those are the ones that it's in between. They're the ones that are fighting for the land. The international community recognizes that. The United States recognizes that. Everybody on the planet recognizes that it's between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And that's why President Trump's peace initiative deals with mainly the Palestinians and the Israelis. That's why President Trump's peace initiatives was going to make a two-state solution, a, a, a uh, put, give the Palestinians an autonomous situation out there in the West Bank. Why didn't they name Russia or China or the Philippines? Because that's not who the dispute is with. It's between Israel and the Palestinians. The international community recognizes that. And so if you look at the geopolitical situation, that's what's going on. And that's one of the main reasons that we say, because the Palestinians, they're all over the, the West Bank anyway. Jesus in Matthew 24 said they're going to have to flee. So if you understand the, the, the boots on the ground there in Israel, what the dispute is over, it's easy to see that the, the agreement has to be between Israel and the Palestinians. That's what we're watching for. And that's the difference between the Abrahamic a, a covenant and the Abraham Accord, which is happening right now in the Middle East. God bless. This has been End of the Age, brought to you by the faithful partners of End Time Ministries. If you're not currently a partner with End Time Ministries, or if you would like more information, we invite you to call us at 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463 or visit us online at endtime.com. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and like our Facebook page.